Hello and welcome to the Red Rock Fantasy Basketball Podcast. My name is Josh Lloyd. I'm back again with another another episode of the pod or uh, another episode of the video if you're watching this live on YouTube, which I hope that some of you guys are attempting to, to watch it on, on YouTube. The timing is a little bit rough for you guys stateside. It's currently uh, 5.30 a.m. Eastern time uh, in the States, but there have been a few people chiming in. And it's good that you can, if you do get a chance to watch watch it live, you can chime in with questions or ask us something or challenge us if we make a point that you want clarification on or um, want more details on. We can answer it live as it goes on. We will uh we will see how it uh how it all pans out, but that's we're, we're recording this one live on YouTube again. And I say we because you might be able to see his head down the bottom of this corner if you are watching. I am joined by the gloriously um hatted Matt Smith. Matt, how are you going? Very well, Josh. How's things? Yeah, it's uh, going all right. Everything is going well. Now, Matt, we are here today to uh, well, actually, before we talk about what we're here to do, let's uh let's talk about your your Twitter account. Where can we find you on Twitter? My Twitter account is at Sman Sports. Of course it is. Everybody get across and follow Matt if you're not doing that. We need to get Matt's Twitter numbers right up there. Matt, we need you We need you bursting over 10,000 Twitter followers. Everyone needs to get out there and follow Matt. He needs to become the uh, the Twitter king of fantasy basketball because you are you are very active on there, Matt, and you do uh, love engaging in conversation. I do, all, all times of the day and night. So if you've got any fantasy questions, hit me up. You can also join in Josh and I are debating all things NBA fantasy basketball. So get on Twitter. If, if you aren't on Twitter, this isn't a a promo placement for Twitter. But if you're not on Twitter and you're playing fantasy basketball, you got to be on Twitter because news breaks Indeed. first on Twitter five minutes before any site. So you must yep. be on Twitter if you're, if you're serious about fantasy basketball. And you've got access to a lot of people on there for to, for questions or opinions or all that sort of stuff. Brings me to my quick little plug, Matt. Um, all Star 5 is a website that you, you and myself are involved in. Just a, a website catered to giving advice to people with fantasy basketball with more detail than what's on Twitter. If you are interested in the concept, head across to All Star 5 and register your interest over there. Matt, you got anything to say about that, the uh, concept that we're sort of kicking off? Uh, check it out. See see if you like it. There's a free trial period. I'm not sure how many days we we went with, but yeah. I can't remember it either. 14, I think. Uh, but jump on there, have a free trial, see what you think. If you like it, then sign up for the season. And yeah, it's probably the best place you can get uh, fantasy basketball advice. And not just simple advice like player A over player B, but we'll give you an in-depth response um, about why we've made a, a decision. So head across there and have a look and just register your interest, your interest if it is something you are interested in. Now, Matt, before we get into what we're going to talk about today on the podcast, and that is Dynasty Rankings, I've got a couple of things I want to touch on. Um, mentioned or hinted, not even hinted, mentioned yesterday on the podcast, there was some big news about the show, and I did tweet it out today, but for anyone who hasn't seen it, the Red Rock Fantasy Basketball Podcast will now be joining the Hardwood Paroxysm uh, Podcast Network. So the podcast will be going out to a, a much wider audience over on Hardwood Paroxysm. And Hardwood Paroxysm is a great website that incorporates... The Hardwood Paroxysm Network incorporates a whole range of different sites. Uh, Nylon Calculus, a really stats-heavy analytics site. Hardwood Paroxysm, uh, Friendly Bounce, a whole whole range of sites over there. And I'm very, uh, very excited to be a part of the, the Hardwood Paroxysm Network with the podcast out there. And they should it should start getting incorporated into their, into their podcast feed within the next week. So there will be a... Hopefully, a big spike in uh, in listeners now that uh, now the podcast will be featured over on the Hardwood Paroxysm site. Matt, do you uh, check out Hardwood Paroxysm very often? I don't, but I will be now. Can you spell that for me, please? Hardwood, H A R D W O O D Paroxysm, yeah. P P A R O X Y S M. Correct. Thank you. First, um, uh, correct, sp- first correct rankings. Well, I'm, I'm, that's, uh, I'm gl- glad to be one of one. I could be one of 100 by the end of this rankings as we get through it. So what, what we did, Matt, we, uh, we get, re- we get re- I get requested it all the time. I'm sure you get requested it all the time as well. Give us your dynasty rankings. There's not enough dynasty rankings. Who are your dynasty ranks? Do you get it all the time? I do. I love, we mentioned this probably a month ago. We've just been inundated with uh, dynasty questions and rankings. So we thought, why not? We'll do it. I've spent hours looking at stats and going through these guys and I could spend more hours going through but enough's enough um, it's time for you and I to put up and shut up that's the that's the problem with it Matt is you can you can go into it and put in hours and hours and you're never happy with it it's never finalized because dynasty rankings are 
oh, they're a pain in the ass. I'll, I'll, I'll say that for a number of reasons. Now, we settled on doing these ones for eight category leagues, rotisserie leagues. Now, I approach it by looking at, okay, there's, this is why they're hard, Matt. There's a couple of ways to look at dynasty leagues. You can look at them. I'm going in and I'm winning now. I want to win in the first two years. You go in and you can get the guys who are older, who will have less currency across the league, and you can maybe get them at bargains. Load up. Don't go for younger talent. Um, you know, Then be set to rebuild in a couple of years. You can go the opposite way and just tank. Like guys last year picking Paul George in the first round uh, or second round and keeping him there and just grabbing injured players, grabbing rookies, trading players for draft picks and loading up for a run in 2017, 2018, that sort of thing, and trying to build themselves as a, as a powerhouse. The fact that there's just two complete opposite ways of trying to approach it means that rankings are almost impossible to come to a complete, you know, 100%, I'm happy with this sort of situation. So the way I did this, Matt, is I looked at it and I wanted to have a bit of a mix. I wanted to to give it as a probably a four-year value, uh, value for these guys with a slight weighting towards the first couple of seasons. Uh, how did you approach it when you're looking at the value of these players? Do, were you yeah. looking well into the future? Do you want to smash everyone in the first season? How did you look at it? Actually, pretty similar. I want to be competitive right off the bat in the first year, but I also want to build for probably a three- to five-year window. Um, so I've got guys who are sort of 24, 25, 26-year-old, just about to come into their prime, ranked over some guys who are now sort of getting into their 29, 30, 31 age range. So these guys will probably fall out of, um, the top sort of 40 and 50 in, in redraft rankings over the next couple of years, uh, the older guys that is, and then the younger guys coming through. So um, I've had a bit of a focus on on age and coming into into the prime. So um, looked at their current value, obviously their future value, and that incorporates their potential, their age, and also their, their injury history. So that's how I sort of, um, yeah, plan, plan these rankings. It's a pretty inexact science. It's hard enough to project for one season, let alone project for four seasons or five seasons in advance when you buy four or five seasons, players are going to be on different teams. You know, there's going to be a massive chunk of the league that play on different teams. We don't know whose role is going to increase, decrease, injuries, whatever. It's pretty much impossible. And that's why when I look at, say, four-year value, I try, tend to weight it towards the, the first one or two years because that's where we've got more chance of being right. Like I could say, yeah, in four years' time, Evan Fournier is going to be the MVP, but it's probably not going to be correct. But if I'm going to say this year, Steph Curry and Kevin Durant and LeBron James are going to be a chance and Anthony Davis, it's more likely to be accurate because I know what's going to happen more with more confidence in the next two years, necessarily the next four or five years. So it is it is really, really an inexact thing uh, to go through. But we've done our best. Well, I've done I've done my best, Matt. I'm, assur- I'm assured that you've done your best as well to try and put together something that gives you just an idea of, of where we see these players. Um, no doubt there's going to be plenty of disagreements. Why did you put this guy here? You missed this guy. You're too low here. You're too high. How did you leave this guy off? And I can't wait to hear it. I want I want to hear the tweets sent at me. You put this guy too low. You left him. You know. You left him off. Whatever. Let me know, Matt. I'm sure you're open to uh, to criticism and uh, and complete uh, berating. I think you and I are going to have a busy day tomorrow going through everyone's tweets saying why didn't you put him there? And I'm already copying it on Twitter because I drafted Kyrie Irving at pick eleven over Damian Lillard. So bring it really? on. Really. Really, did we we oh that's I, I love that pick. I love Irving over Lillard. Your mate VP. Did he? Yes. V- v- yeah, he was getting stuck not, in. He was not happy. Let me tell you. I'm very happy. Well, he's he's a he's a Portland fan, so there's there's a reason there. But I'm, I'm nice. very I'm very happy with Irving at 11. I'm pretty sure he is Vivek. If I'm if I'm incorrect, please let me know. But I'm pretty sure he's a Portland fan. He has an an inordinate amount of Myers Leonard and CJ McCollum questions, and that's what makes me think he's a Portland fan. Maybe he's not. I think he lives in New York, but I think he's a Blazers guy. Let us know, Vivek, if we are, if we are incorrect. Um, touching on that, Matt, the Red Rock Listener Leagues have all kicked off, and we're almost through the first round, I think, in all but one, and there's a pretty good reason for why we're not through in that one. I think it's the, a guy who's a new addition to the league who's currently serving in the Peace Corps in South Africa and has some in, intermittent internet connections. So that's why that league has stalled a little bit but the, the leagues are going through okay yours and mine i think is through to its third round um yeah. and that's, yeah, that's about, most of them are about that second third round area let's talk dynasty let's uh i think dynasty. we'll just 
let's talk dynasty. If anyone understands what that word is, it's actually dynasty said with an Adelaide accent. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk our top ten, Matt. Let's do a a reveal. Let's count down from ten to one, starting with you. And perhaps I think you'll see a lot of people with the huh when you reveal your number ten. Let's go. Who is it? All right, number ten is the number one draft pick of this year, Carl Anthony Towns. Now, people Explain are going to go, yourself, sir. you are crazy. Josh, this dude is going to be Anthony Davis light in three to four years' time. He's going to be a 20 and 10 guy. He's going to be he's not going to be, he's not going to be Anthony Davis light. He's going to be Anthony Davis almost. Well, he's not going to be, he's not, he's not a watered down version. I only say light because he may not be at that. 25 and 12 mark and the three blocks and the one and a half, two steals, but he'll be 20 and 10. He'll be at least two blocks, pushing two and a half blocks per game. He'll be a steal a game and he'll be shooting 50% from the field, 80% from the line. He could throw in 30 to 43s per season as well. Uh, Just in short, this dude is going to be the beast. I think at the end of this season, he'll be top 60, a top 60 ranked player. Um, This is just sort of in, in redraft leagues talking now. End of next season, I think he'll be a top 30. At the end of his third season, he's going to be a top 15 player, and that's when he's going to push um, push past guys like Mark Gasol, Pau Gasol, Al Horford, Millsap, Aldridge. So if I had the choice, I'd be taking Carl Anthony Towns over all Matt's of those guys. That's dropping out a little bit there. I don't know if you can see oh, back. You there? You got me? Yep. Yeah, go got ahead. Me. So yep. I was just saying that he's going to be – I think he'll be a top 60 player at the end of this season – the end of the following season, I think he'll be a top 30 player and that will push him past part, um, guys like Mark Gasol, Al Horford, uh, Paul Millsap, LaMarcus Aldridge. So I think in two years' time, he'll be past these guys already. At the end of his third season, he'll be a top 15 player and by the end of his fourth se- season, I expect him to be a top five guy. Now, with those sort of projections I mentioned before, if you're bringing those future projections into the present, he's already going to be better than DeMarcus Cousins in a Roto League with those solid percentages, um, the threes, and the steals and blocks will be be similar to what you can get from Cousins. But um, I'm drafting for a little bit of short-term pain over the next 12 to 24 months. But, Josh, it's all about long-term domination with Carl Anthony Towns. That's 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 very accurate. You need to be uh, ready to have a guy that's probably outside the top 100 for about the first two to three months of this season, might end up finishing inside the top 100, top 80 this year. But you're going to have to get him early because he'll be a top 10 guy in, in two to three years. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Now, I had him down at 22 because I am favoring these first two years a little bit uh, a little bit heavier. And that means that he's not going to be a top 20 guy in the first two seasons. So that's why I've got him down a little bit. But if you were going and saying, you know what, I've got pick 12 or something in a draft and I really want to you know, push myself. I don't think I'm going to get an elite talent. I don't think I'm going to build a strong team. It's not a horrible thing to get a guy that in two years' time could be a top five player. Um, he's he just stands out as a beacon, as a guy that look through all this list of guys who aren't in the top five that who will be in the top five. He just stands out because his game and for Roto especially, he just he can tick ev- every single box like eight eight boxes like points, threes, rebounds, assists, steals, box, free throw percentage, field goal percentage. He can actually give you a positive contribution in probably all of them. And there's not many guys who are eight. Cat- Anthony Davis is in an eight category guy. Towns could be in an eight category guy to a degree. It's it'll very exciting. Like, I do go. It'll be like four years ago when someone drafted Pau Gasol over Anthony Davis, and now Anthony Davis is arguably the best player in, in fantasy. So that's that's what we're talking about. He's just going to be that good. He he is going to be good. It's just you just do have to watch that you are going to you are going to cop it um, short term. Like you will be spending a first round pick if you go by that ranking, a first round pick on a guy who might be outside the top hundred for a year, and that's that's something that that could definitely happen. But the the chances of him not realizing into a, a top fantasy guy is it's there, but it's not high. Now, Matt, with my number ten. Now, remember, these are eight cat rotos, so no turnover. I've got John Wall at number 10. Maybe a little bit vanilla, a little bit bland, but he's, he's a guy probably outside the top 10 at the moment, but I think he jumps into that position. Um, the Wizards will continue to get stronger. I think he'll, he'll his scoring should go up. Hopefully, if he, all he needs to do is get his threes up, 1.2, 1.3 triples, and he's easily a top 10 guy for me. 
Um, we'll talk about what you had, John Wall, in a second, but I've got him just sitting there uh, comfortably at number 10. As I said, I'm waiting things a little bit more to, to the present. Number nine, Matt, uh, your boy who uh, Vivek was not impressed with at number nine. Who have you got there? Yeah, Kyrie Irving at the Cavs. Uh, the kid's still only 23 years of age. Yes, he is injury prone. Um, I like last season how he did play the 75 games a year. That gives me confidence in drafting him, not only now, um, but long term as well. Yes, he is coming off that fractured kneecap, but I'm confident he'll be he'll be fit and ready to go for, for this season coming. Scores, assists, rebounds, great steals and uh, threes combo. Um, I'm loving his field goal percentage up around the 47% mark now uh, playing next to LeBron and free throws you can't go wrong as well in, into the mid to high 80s. So Kyrie Irving, one of the best uh, young point guards in the league and he's comfortably a top 10 player. Got him at number 11 and in hindsight, look at it and go, maybe I should have had him inside the top 10. You can't go wrong having him inside the top 10. He, he was... A massive surprise last season you know, with the addition of LeBron James and Kevin Love actually got better by a significant amount and taking him inside the end of the the end of the first round in redraft leagues this year is not a crazy move I, I really like that that, uh, that Kyrie Irving selection at number nine uh, I've gone with Jimmy Butler he is uh, outside the top 10 he was a sort of a mid-teens to mid-20s guy last year faded off a little bit I think that he can, if he's not already, he's going to be the Bulls' best player and he really develops into a, a guy who can contribute in a number of areas. He can dish the ball. He scores. He hits threes. His percentages are great. His steal numbers are there and he gets some pretty decent rebounds. Yeah, his minutes might drop a little bit under Fred Hoiberg, but the pace of the game will improve. The offense will improve and I think that'll help his numbers to to maybe exceed slowly, but if not, break even. And as his natural progression goes, as he's starting off on his second contract, this is the time for him to really start dominating the shooting guard position in the league and i i i love him at at pick nine uh i'm not worried about him having a drop off this season are you concerned about him dropping off this season excluding dynasty uh no i'm not i'd still like to see what the it's fred hoiberg there in the balls isn't it yep coach sorry um i'd like to see what he's going to do with that team in the offense um but no there's no rule Real concerns there with Jimmy Butler is a is a really solid pick um, for me second round in in redraft leagues and in my dynasty rankings I have him down a little bit further around round seventeen um, just behind Clay Thompson and, and before Paul George but yeah I've got no issue with him being a, a top twenty dynasty player at all. Let's go with number eight Matt and we've both got the same guy here LeBron James at number eight. Um, he is getting older. He is uh, declining somewhat. We saw that massive drop in his field goal percentage. He's not going to decline to the, the situation where he becomes that bad in the next four years, but he's not really in a position where he's going to get better. And I think this is probably the right spot to get him. He's going to be great for at least the next two to three years, probably really great for probably the next four to five. Maybe that 50 is a bit bit debatable, but this feels this feels right, obviously, to you and obviously to me at number eight. Yeah, I think he's still got four to five good years, like good years as in elite years left in him at, at this level. Um, that hopefully those minutes do decrease a little bit so it gives him some longevity. But as you said, field goal percentage has come back a bit, little bit. I'm not too concerned. You, you're getting a, a triple-double threat every night, points, rebounds, assists, the steals, the threes are still there. So, uh, yeah, LeBron James is still a lot, an elite player. At number seven, you've got John Wall, who we talked about before. I've got Kawhi Leonard. At number seven. Um, now, notice you've got him down at number 12. Matt, um, I'll just talk about what I've got there with Kawhi. He is he's a, a guy who was fantastic down the stretch last year again, much better than I anticipated, especially his head to head play. But in rotos where he really uh, excels, um, he's probably a better nine cat rotor than eight cat rotor guy. But the rationale I've got here, yeah, he probably won't get much of a chance, as much of a chance to really break out this year with the addition of Lamarcus Aldridge. But when Tim Duncan retires, when Ginobili retires, it'll be Aldridge, it'll be Leonard, and they'll have to absorb so much of that that weight that you know, we might see Leonard drop four or five spots this year. We also might see the year after him jump 10 and become a real, like he might be an 18 and 8, one and a half, three, two and a half steal, 1.3 blocks sort of guy, two or three assists, good percentages. He could be a really, really superb player. And I'm just interested why, he, why have you got him outside the top 10 for a roto guy? It, not that he's far down, but what's what's your thought process? Uh, I'm a I'm a big point guards and power forward centre guy. I, I give them waiting, so I couldn't really squeeze him in my top 
seven guys are pretty much the same as yours. Um, and then we've differed with Wall and Leonard. We've got LeBron. Um, and then I had to put Kyrie Irving in there being a point guard and Carl Anthony Towns. And then Chris Paul was the other one that I had over Kawhi as well, just for the fact that I love those point guards, love those assistant steals. Oh, are, well, you, are, gives you, steals anyway. are you not Mainly concerned about Paul? Uh, a little bit, but for me, dropping he's, off after a year or two. Uh, maybe a couple of years. I think he's got a shorter lifespan than than LeBron, but I'll give him another two, three years um, at that at that level, and he's still going to be one of those leaders in the assistant steals categories. I dropped Chris Paul down to third uh, to twelfth. So it's only one spot below you, but um, I've got him at the same as where you've got Kawhi. I just think that Kawhi, yeah, you're right. Point guards and power forward do dominate fantasy in general, but. I find that in Roto, you get a lot of value out of wing guys. They're the guys who can contribute across the board. Rudy Gay, much, much better Roto. Nick Batum, same sort of story. Jimmy Butler, better Roto player. I find the wing guys, Gordon Haywood, uh, generally tend to be better all-around contributors in, in rotisserie-type leagues. And that's where I see Kawhi getting that bigger boost because he is able to contribute all across the board, whereas point guards can't, big men can't. And it really, it really depends on how you're trying to build your team. But that's the way I, I tend to to look at it is that those wing guys get a boost when, in a rotisserie format when I'm looking at it. Who's next? Well, you know what? Our, our, our top six is the same guys, just in different order. So you go through from six to one. Uh, six, I had Demarcus Cousins. You've drafted him in the in our listener league. Uh, what a beast! Twenty four years of age. The only thing that concerns me about Cousins is is his uh, efficiency with his percentages. I'd like to see his field goal come up to around fifty percent. Um, free throw a little bit higher as well, but that's the only knock. His, his free throws had a huge improvement over the last. He, he took it up to seventy five percent last year. Like some. Yep. That's, that's a, a guess, but it's it's around that number. He had a big improvement. I'm not worried. About, he's field goal percentage, yeah, I hope that comes up, but I'm not worried about his free throws. You got next, five. Uh, I was just looking at his free throw percentage. Yeah, yeah seven, did, but... 78%. So actually, that's pretty good. His field goal percentage was 46.7, so I'd still like to that, see that, that come up. That needs, work. That, needs, that needs work as a big man, but 78, considering how bad he was, he was a 60 sort of 63% guy. He's he's done it Blake Griffin style and taken his his free throws up to not only a, a passable level but a helpful level. The rest of your who's the who's your top five? Top five Russell Westbrook at five, uh, second best point guard in the league behind Steph Curry. Do I'm going to take you through my top four while I'm here. I threw it all. All right, I'm going to start with one. Anthony Davis is the best player in in fantasy basketball right now. Best long-term player, 22, still hasn't reached his ceiling. Um, just scary to think what he could do even this coming season with um, Alvin Gentry there running that offense and up-tempo, giving him more touches. We've heard about him, you know, practicing his three-point shooting, spreading the floor. If he can throw in 33-pointers a year, that's just gravy. I've gone Kevin Durant with number two. Um, it was only 12 months ago that he was the number one player in fantasy basketball. Yes, I have a slight concern around his foot injury, um, but I think OKC will be able to manage it and he'll come back and he'll have a really strong season. And I think he's going to show that he is a, a top two fantasy player. So I've got him at two. I know you've got him at four, Josh. Yes. <clears throat> now that leaves me with James Harden and Steph Curry. These two are so close in terms of stats. Now, I've got James Harden at three. The only reason being that he's 18 months younger than Steph Curry. So it could actually come down to I could actually get two more years um, of elite production out of James Harden towards the end of his career um, over Steph Curry. So that's the only reason why I've got Harden, Harden ranked higher than Curry is he's 18 months younger. Interesting. I went with Davis at one as well. Um, I went Curry to Harden three. Um, I went, look, Harden, I think, was close to I think he I think he may have been actually ranked higher than Curry in Roto leagues last year. I just think that Curry's not necessarily going to get as easy a ride as, as what he had this season um, in terms of being able to sit so many fourth quarters. He won't have to play. He won't play 31 minutes a game. He could go out there. And he might have to play 35, 36 minutes a game, and then his numbers could just go bananas. And that's what I'm sort of banking on. Is that in some of these seasons he's he's not going to just cruise through the season and be able to have the luxury of sitting all these games. Therefore, he's going to have to play more minutes and his numbers are going to have to come up a little bit as well. 
And that's what really kept him and Harden uh, as close as, not that he would have blown him out of the water, but if he had played the four more minutes a game than what Harden did, his numbers would have been astronomically higher. Well, not astronomically, I'm using big words that don't need to be used. His numbers would have been bigger and he would have been ranked higher. And that's where I'm banking on there that he's not going to have the same sort of run that he had this season in terms of just not playing fourth quarters and his minutes will therefore go up and his numbers will therefore go up as well. Durant, I've got it four. I am worried about the foot as well, especially when I've got other guys there, Davis, Curry and Harden, who I know that even if Durant comes back to full health, I haven't, I've missed out a bit, but I haven't missed out on a massive, massive chunk. Even before last season, before the foot injury, um, I was saying, you know, Durant is the clear one, but Curry, Harden and Davis are a lot closer than what we've seen guys to Durant in years prior. And it wasn't that much of a, like, you have to get Durant or else you're going to get get killed. It, you had the opportunity of all these guys. And I think with the risk there with Durant, I want to put him behind those four guys. I went with uh, Cousins at five and I went with Westbrook at six. So just flip-flopping those two compared to what you had in your top 10. So if we run through our top 10s now, Matt, uh, I went Davis, Curry, Harden, Durant, Cousins, Westbrook, Leonard, James, Butler, Wall, and what was your top 10? Uh, I had Davis, Durant, James Harden, Steph Curry, Westbrook Cousins, Wall, LeBron, Kyrie Irving, and Kyle Anthony Towns. Okay, so that's our that's our top ten. Now, what we should do, Matt, is we'll go through each other's ranking and let's uh, let's pick out names. We'll go back and forward, not necessarily pick on, but like, why did you have this guy here? And look for sort of big discrepancies between where we've got guys ranked. The first one I want to start with, Matt, is I want to look at you and go Nerlens Noel at number thirteen. Please explain. Please explain. I love Nealon's Noel. Uh, dominated the second half of last season. Average off the top of my head, I think it was about 2.2 steals and 2.3 blocks. You're getting... It was something insane. You're getting elite uh, point guard steals from a big man. You're still getting the elite blocks. His full uh, free throw percentage was a lot better than I actually thought it was going to be. It was around the 60 mark. Still getting rebounds. Um, he had an offensive game as well, so he was in, in double figures scoring. Now, the addition of Jalil Okafor will be interesting to see what that does to um, New Orleans' rebounds in particular. I'm not worried about the steals and blocks, but to me, he's going to be a guy for the next 10 years. You can bank on two steals, two blocks per game, um, and just anchor those defensive stats. He's going to be massive. Now, I've got him down at 36, which feels low even looking at it now, but I am worried about the, the, the free throws. He was shot 65% down the stretch last season, which was probably a bit better than anticipated. But if he keeps shooting at that rate and then he gets his offensive game going more, which will mean more trips to the free throw line, it's going to be even more of a negative impact. Now, I don't think he's ever going to be the drain that, that John Ray, uh, Jordan is, Andre Drummond is, or Dwight Howard is. But if he can't get him up to 72 73%, it's uh, it can be a real issue in Roto leagues. Yeah, he's going to give you good, great blocks, great steals. The points will never blow you away. The rebounds will probably he's never going to be a twelve rebound, eleven rebound sort of guy. Um, and you've got to really make sure you offset that negative. That's why I've got him down low. It probably is a little bit low, um, but I am worried about as he develops him getting to the line more often and therefore missing more free throws and becoming more of a concern. Yeah, his, his post all star stats: thirteen points, ten rebounds. If you just look at his March stats as a small sample size in 17 games, 14 points, 11 rebounds, the two blocks, 2.4 steals, uh, 50% from the line and nearly 65% from the free throw line. So uh, contributing in all areas, only the 2.2 turnovers as well if you are playing in nine cat legs. Yeah, look, there's no doubt. His steals and blocks are amazing. He's going to get his field goal percentage up over 50 on a constant basis. The rebounds, I think Okafor and Embiid will, if Embiid ever plays, will... Uh, that he won't be able to get 10 rebounds a game with those guys there. Um, but the offensive game should improve. It's just that free throw that, that really does scare me off in, in rotisserie leagues. Okay, you might, able, uh, you, might, you might be able to get 10 rebounds a game if Tony Roten's still run on the point. The people in the front row can get 10 rebounds a game just from errant passes from him of throwing them over guys' heads. If anyone's sitting in the uh, courtside seats, they'll be able to get themselves a few turnovers off Tony Roten passes. Let's... Um, well, you go and pick on one of my guys. Who who do you look at my list and go, Josh, are you smoking crack again? <laughs> I want to talk to you about percentages. First of all, I know you don't have Howard Drummond or DeAndre Jordan in your 100 list. When you're building a 
Roto team, a, a roster, what mm-hmm. sort of percentages are you aiming for? I want, I want 47 to 48 field goal, mm-hmm. and I want 77 to 78 free throw. Okay, very nice. I agree. I aim for the 50 and 80. Usually don't get there, but if I can get pretty much the same. If you get, if you get 50 and 80, you win those categories. Yep, I agree. If you can get 47, 48, and 78 from the free throw line, I'll take that as well. So explain to me then, I understand why you won't have Howard and Drummond in your top 100 because I don't either. Just talk to me a little bit about, um, sorry, uh, Howard and DeAndre Jordan. I've got uh, Drummond, you don't. But explain to me then how you've got guys like um, Ricky Rubio with his 36% field goal percentage, uh, Michael Carter Williams, who, who's a liability at both uh, both percentages, and also Alfred Payton. Explain to me how you can have those guys in your in your top hundred. Okay, it, it it is a good question, but the negative impact that Drummond, Howard, and Jordan have in those categories far far exceeds the negative impact that Rubio, Payton, and Carter Williams has. To give an example. DeAndre Jordan, in order to, if you paired DeAndre Jordan, which is impossible to do with, I think it's James Harden, uh, Steph Curry, and Chris Paul, your team free throw percentage of just those four guys would be 72%. Now that's taking like the three, three of the best free throw shooters in terms of volume and impact with him and gets it to 73 like there, you can't get to a competitive level. Whereas if you put someone like Rubio there, you can. We're not talking. At, look, we talk with Drummond, and we talk. If you talk standard scores, he's like a minus four and a half in his free throws. Rubio is a minus two. It's a big difference. It's it's more than double the impact that what the, what he has in that category, and it is impossible to come back from that. And unless you're going to go the controversial punter category in roto, which is so hard to pull off, you can't deal with it. Whereas yeah, Carter Williams, and actually, no, Carter Williams didn't suck in his percentages last year, especially in Milwaukee. They improved a lot. Um, we talk about how he's a bad shooter and all that sort of stuff, but I'm going to bring his numbers up now. He didn't suck in Milwaukee. Now, that's just one player as an example. And Alfred Payton, the same, down the stretch, he didn't suck as well. Carter Williams, in the last two months, let's have 43 he shot from the, uh, from, from the field and 78 from the line. That's not sucking. Yeah, 43 is okay. It's, you can easily deal with that. 78 is awesome. Now, I don't think he's going to be a 78% shooter. But he, he yeah, if he shoots 74% and 43% from the field, you can overcome that. Rubio, Rubio is not a horrible shooter. If he can shoot 40% from the field, you can, you can overcome that. You can't overcome those free throws. You can pair them with the three biggest impact free throw shooters and you still don't come anywhere close to being competitive. That category is written off. It's done. And and then even if you tried to become competitive, you'd have to tailor every single pick to being a high volume, high percentage free throw shooter. And you you sacrifice every other category. It's it's really hard to do. And that's that's right. why I don't have those guys in because when you look at every single category, every stat, every player, those three guys in that category are just miles ahead of in terms of their negative contribution than any other player in any other category. I, I agree with what you're saying. I've got some stats here. So we... You mentioned Andre Drummond. Now, I've got him in my yep. top 100. Last season, he attempted 4.5 free throw attempts per game. I still think you can work with that. Um, so let's pair him with James Harden to begin with, the best free throw shooter in, in the game. Taking Drummond's free throw uh, into account, pairing them with Harden, that gets you at 71%, right? So that's still yep. going to be at the bottom of your rankings, correct, Josh? Yeah, that's, that's definitely down the bottom. If you can grab someone like a Demata Rosen in the middle round, his six makes on 7.2. Now that brings you up into 75% range. So to me, that's middle of the pack range. In our I think that's, uh, I think that's yeah, okay, maybe it is. In our ESPN Roto in our ESPN Roto League last year, uh, there yep. was about four or five guys in the 75% range. If if we could get that percentage to 76%. We would have actually finished uh, either fifth or sixth in a 12 team late, which isn't too bad when you've got John, uh, Andre Drummond there holding down your blocks, your rebounds, boosting your field goal percentage, and also getting you a steal per game. So I think Drummond, you can work with him. Like you said, it is going to be tough and you are going to build around him, but getting some um, elite shooters, 
once again, if you can get Serge Ibaka and his blocks and his free throw percentage, he's not going to impact it positively, but he's not going to hurt you. He's not going to drag it down further because he shoots nearly 80% from the free throw line. So I still think, I think you can work with Drummond as well as Rubio. <clears throat> Let's compare Rubio with Anthony Davis. I think that's going to be a really popular combo coming into this season because if you take Davis number one, you're going to have to find a point guard later if you're not punting assists like you are, Josh, in the in the listening league. So a Rubio-Davis combo, you're going to be at 46% from the field, which isn't too bad. You like to be and a little bit okay, higher, but yeah. once we're around the mark. Later on in the draft, we get one of our favourite guys. We go and grab Tyson Chandler. Tyson Chandler from last year, all of a sudden our field goal percentage is up to 50%. Yep. So once again, that's perfect. That's right where we want to be. Now, if we're grabbing other point guards, they're going to be shooting 44, 46% from the from the field. So that's going to drag it back down. So we're just going to have to be mindful. If we're getting point guards, we're also going to have to get bigs who are above 50% to keep that stable. So I think those two guys in particular, you can work with them in roto leagues. This is why I've got – that's why I have Rubio in there because it, you can get – add two guys at you – know, Chandler's not a big cost and you go from being middle of the pack to if you shoot over 50%, you're – you're winning that category. You know, to win a roto league in general, this is a big generalization, but you need to average, say it's a 12-team league, you need to get about nine points per category on average, eight and a half to nine points. So if you get a five in one, you need to smash a lot of 11s out in some other categories. You, you, you can't go by and get, I'm going to get a five here, a five here. You've got to be, you've got to be right up there. You've got to be eights and you've got to be nines across the board pretty much to, to win a roto league. Is, is, that, is that your experience? It is, and that that's why I find it hard to own Michael Carter Williams because he's hurting both of those percentages. You're just going to have to give you so you're giving yourself so much work to do in drafts to get both of those percentages back up. Alfred Payton's another one. Marcus Smart's another one. I just cannot own these guys in roto league. So you're going to that's, that's you the thing, have, man. He he didn't hurt it though. Carter Williams didn't once he got to Mook. He didn't hurt it. Forty three and seventy eight's not hurting it. That, that's not. Forty-three percent is not. It's still a lot of work to do. Oh, but it, it's if you if you pair that with Anthony, with Anthony Davis, you're your top two. If just of those two guys, you're you're you know close to fifty percent. It, it's yeah. not as big a hole. It, it, it's the impact of that is about five times less than Drummond's free throw percentage. But Carter Williams is still taking three more field goal attempts than than Rubio. So you're working with a higher volume. It is, but his his impact in that. In that category, it's you know it's not as big as the the negative impact that that Drummond has in his free throws. The Drummond, it, it's it's you're basing it all off you know standard scores and Z scores. We're talking four and a half to five or five times more negative impact that Drummond has than what Carter Williams does for his for his field goals, and that's big. Like that's a that's a big difference. Let me give you an example of of two point guards who were very similar across the board in terms of counting stats last year. Michael Carter Williams. And Jeff T. Now, points, sort of 15, 16 per game, assists around the seven mark. Carter Williams, yes, more rebounds. Steals were quite close. Um, and Jeff T had a little bit more threes. Now, Carter Williams on the season, I know you said he had a good second half of the season, but on the season, his field goal percentage was at 38%. Oh, uh, it wasn't good. Jeff, Jeff T was at 46%. So if you draft Jeff T around probably ideally two rounds, but at least a round earlier than Michael Carter-Williams, that is just going to give you just the biggest boost in your field goal percentage come the end of the season in Roto Leagues. I've got Jeff Teague at 36 and, uh, 35 and Carter-Williams at 70, so I do agree with you in that sense. But I'm, what I'm trying to get, the point I'm trying to get across is you can recover. It, it's not an ideal situation. And having Rubio at 69 and Carter-Williams at 70 where I've got them means they're probably going to be drafted by someone else. So I'm probably not going to have to deal with that problem. But if the situation arose, I could. You can't deal with a problem like Dwight Howard. You can't deal with DeAndre Jordan. You might be competitive. You might finish an honourable fourth or a third, but to win it is Herculean to get there. It just requires everything to go right in a roto league because you need to be you know, nines in every category. And if you're a one, it means you've got to add yourself an extra. It means you've got to get tens in every category, and that's that's hard work. It can be done. Don't get me wrong, but it's the odds of it happening are low. I've, I've played that. Go on, keep going, mate. So you've, uh, you've picked apart my uh, my omission of, of those. What did you want to say then? I was just going to add that I've been playing basketball for fantasy basketball for about 15 years. 
probably participate in two or three roto leagues per year and i've seen a punt free throw strategy work in roto leagues once and that was uh in dwight howard's heyday and then it was probably the the standard howard josh smith rondo punt free throw it's it's bloody um, hard hard. it is so difficult and that's exactly why i put these guys off the list because you know i could i could put them on an 80 or 90 but they're just even if you picked them at 80 or 90 and you built your team perfectly our last pick i'm going to pick drum forget it your team's just done you just blew it all up in one pick anyway let me go back and and have a look at it your uh, your selections and see if there's something I can uh, poke a hole in to a degree. I'm probably not. Gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this one, Matt. I'm gonna say you've got Giannis added to compo at 21, but I actually don't I don't hate it. I actually quite like it. I've got him a bit lower at 43. Again, because I just don't really know if he's gonna have a big breakout this year. I don't know if it comes in next year. I think you know, in five years' time he we could be talking a top 20 guy. I just think 21 now is probably a little bit ambitious for Giannis. How do you uh, rationalise the the fact that you've got Giannis you know, poking his head into the top 20? Yeah, he's a guy that's still probably at least two, um, probably three to four years away from really breaking out. But just what what a ceiling this, this guy's got. 20 years of age, only been in the league a couple of years. Um, I want to give you some, some splits. I know, once again, this is a small sample size coming from March last year, but this is, this is what Giannis could be looking at a couple of years' time. He had 16 points. 7.5 rebounds, uh, the 2.6 assists, they're okay from a small forward position, but the yeah, 1.4 right. blocks and the steal per game at 53% from the field and 77 from the free throw line. They're, they're crazy numbers. They're getting into your Kawhi Leonard type, type numbers. And I think there's no reason why he can't be around that mark. Less steals, a few more blocks. Um, that Milwaukee team is going to be really good in the next couple of years as well. I'm, I'm thinking the Milwaukee Bucks of this coming season will be the Atlanta Hawks from last season. Their starting five will have heaps of value. They'll also have a six-man like an OJ Mayo type off the bench who'll have some value as well. Um, really liking what the Milwaukee Bucks are putting together, and Giannis is at the top of that list. I'm going to get back to Giannis in just a sec, but we do have a, a question, a, a live question coming in from everybody's favourite uh, Twitter guy, uh, Robert Downey Jr. masquerading as Starks underscore industry. Uh, hashtag Iron Man saves lives. I'm sorry I'm late to the party. In the Red Rock Listener League that you guys are in, who do you have to have so far? So, diverting from Dynasty, I just want to answer this live on air as we talk. Matt, who do you have so far in the Listener League? You pick, uh, you pick 11. Yeah, pick 11. I took Kyrie Irving. Um, favored him over Damian Lillard for, for a range of reasons. And then at 14, I backed that up with Rudy Gobert. Now, you might say 14 for Rudy Gobert is way too high, but my next pick's at pick 35, and there was no way Rudy Gobert was going to be there. So it was either a case of I take him now or I don't get him at all. Um, So that's what I did. I drafted him. I wanted him on my team. I've got him on my team. It was this close between Rudy Gobert and Nealon's Noel. Um, I spoke about him before and how keen I am on, on his value. Josh, I wasn't happy with you today. You took him at 28. I was, fingers crossed, somehow he'd fall through to 35, but um, you got a steal there at 28. So, yeah, I've got Kyrie Irving and Rudy Gobert to bookend my team, and I've got a pick in about five or six picks' time, and there's still um, a number of good fantasy players sitting there waiting for me. There's a lot. Now, my I, I went at pick four. I picked Demarcus Cousins. Probably a little bit of an upset over Westbrook, Paul, Durant, LeBron. I just think he's going to be a monster in a head-to-head format. Jimmy Butler on the way back. Really happy with him getting getting a shooting guard. He fits exactly what I'm trying to do. And then, as you mentioned, New Orleans Noel at, in round three. I love that. And the reason that I'm really happy about getting Butler and Noel is that I'm punting assists, Matt, as you alluded to earlier. Um, that means my point guards are going to be devalued. But I still want steals. And I've got Jimmy Butler and New Orleans Noel, two of the best non-point guard guys at steals. Um Demarcus Cousins is pretty handy at it as well. My steals category is, I'm not going to say it's locked up, but it's looking pretty healthy for not picking any point guards. And that's that's why those guys are so valuable. Not to mention Butler's ability to hit threes and score in his percentage and Noel's blocks and rebounds and points and field goal percentage and Cousins all around game. But really sort of helping the guys whose value in steals is going to offset the need for me to get a point guard. So that's, that's why I went there. So thank you for uh, tuning in, Mr. Downey Jr., Back to Giannis and the fact that you've got him that high. I mentioned I've got him in the 40s. I do think he's going to be great, but I think it's going to be, as you said, it's going to be, it's going to take time. And 
I'm going to keep hammering home this point. I am waiting these for the first couple of years because we have more certainty, or in my opinion, there's more certainty in the first couple of years, and it's really hard to know what's going to happen. If you're going all out for 2017, I've got no issue getting Giannis real high because in 2017, he probably is a top 20 guy, almost without a shadow of a doubt. But you might have a, a season of a top, a top 60 or a top 65. They've gotten stronger this year, the Bucks, um, Jabari Parker returns, Greg Munro's added in, and that might take... Uh, not necessarily slow the development of Giannis, but slow the ability of him to accumulate stats with those other guys there until he's really ready to take over. So that's why I've got him a little bit lower, but I do have him, uh, still got him inside the top 50, which he's probably not going to finish this season. Uh, Matt, what do you hate out of my list? Uh, talk to me about Camilo Anthony. You've got him ranked at 31. I have him ranked at 55. This probably comes back to the fact that we've got slightly different um time frames around our team but for a guy who gave up halfway through last season what's your take on uh, Melo? Yeah look that was piss poor from Melo last year and you would have heard me go on about it plenty of times I think that he will uh, he's got at least three you know, pretty high level seasons left he's an underrated fantasy guy for all the all the crap that he cops for being selfish and you know what and he cops it from me as well but when he's on in fantasy look his stretch before he actually shut it down he was putting up some really big numbers like numbers inside the top 20 he can easily be a top 20 guy again this year and again the year after and i think that's enough for me to to judge him uh, at number 30 uh, i think he starts to drop off a little bit after that but you're going to get two top 20 seasons out of him and i don't reckon you'd have to pick him inside the top 20 in a dynasty and for someone who, who wants to really start competing that's the sort of bargain play you can get yeah he can drop a bit even when he drops off he's not going to drop off to the point where he becomes a nothing because his game is not based on athleticism he's still going to be able to score he's still going to be able to get in there and, and bang and, and rebound and he's not as selfish as you think he does pass the ball he does get assists his game is going to um fade into older age rather gracefully i think from a fantasy point of view he's not just going to drop off because yeah his athleticism is gone he was playing a lot of the season on one knee and still was able to put up some pretty decent numbers so i'm um i'm happy with mallow there but again if you're looking for two years down the track then there's no point picking him at 30 because he'll be a top 50 guy by then Look at yours. What can we uh, what can we get out of this here? Um, I don't hate a lot of it to be honest, mate. Which is which is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, it's uh, no. It, look, it's let, let, let's let's talk Paul George. I've got him at fifteen. You've got him at yeah. eighteen. That's that's worry related, isn't it? That it is for me. Because he could be at four or five spots high. I could easily have him at number ten or number eleven. It, it's worry related. I I am petrified of, of of broken legs like this. I've just seen too many. We've seen a lot of examples, Matt, in Australian Football League down here of guys breaking their leg and it's not if, if it's not done for them, it's two years out of the game or two years, two and a half years to get back to their best. Um, and yeah. that's what worries me about him. Yeah, I, I had Paul George probably four spots higher. I think I had him at 15 there at one stage and then I just moved him down because I just feel more confident drafting Clay Thompson and, and Jimmy Butler in a similar position. You just don't know how Paul George is going to come back this season. He probably doesn't know himself. There's probably doubts in the back of his mind. Um, we know when he was fit and healthy, he was a top 10 player. I don't know whether he can be that top 10, top 15 guy back straight in his first season, maybe two seasons, three seasons down the track, but it's a high risk, high reward move. And I'm just not willing to gamble that early on him. No, it's, Paul George has gone in the first round in a couple of our listener leagues, which uh, I'm not a huge fan of, but it, it could work out pretty well. But I just, I just, I don't see it for him this year. To be honest, I, I just, I can't see it, and I am worried about it. It's like why I've got Durant at four because who knows what happens? It's, it's not a good thing to have a question mark heading into the season. It could work out brilliantly, could work out poorly. Um, okay. let's talk Victor Oladipo. I've got him at 24. You've got him at 22. Yep. I think I'm. I think I think we're both low. I think, I think we're low on him. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he finished that ranking this season, come to think of it. Now, he went at pick 28 in a league. I don't know if it was one of the listener leagues or whatever, and someone said, oh, that seems a bit high. And I saw some rankings on some other sites that had him at 45 or 48. And to me, that's bonkers. I think that I think he's a top 25 guy this year. 95% confidence. Do you think that? Yep. Yeah, definitely. No, uh, no I, doubt. I think, I think that... 
I'm looking at him at 24 and I'm going, you're, you're a dickhead, Josh. Why is he at 24? He should be a top 20, but I can't have everyone in the top 20. Um, if I got him at 24 in a dynasty, I would be rubbing my hands for a very long time until uh, until they got really uncomfortable and sweaty. If, if we look at uh, post-All-Star last season, 20 points, four rebounds, four and a half assists, nearly two steals, 1.5 threes, free throw percentage is really good. 42% from the field is not great. There's... Two concerns I have around Victor Oladipo. One, it's the minutes. He played 38 minutes after the All-Star game last year now. I can't see him staying at that level. Surely that's got to come back to, say, 32 to 34 minutes. So I don't think he can possibly play any more minutes. The second issue I have is Scott Skiles, their new coach. Defensive-minded coach. That might be good because it might help his defensive side of the ball. I'm just not sure how that's going to relate the offensive side of the ball, um, increasing his points and assists so and his threes as well. So, yeah, I like him, um, have concerns with the coach. And in terms of a ranking, I think Gian- well, Giannis is going to be a better player in a couple of years' time. Draymond Green is a stud. We've got Paul George. We've got Jimmy Butler. We've got Clay Thompson. I just can't see how we can move him up any further. I I am I'm still thinking he's going to be a top twenty guy, um, if not this season. Next season. Well, you you could that's replace a, some that's of your, a, that's your, a your problem. Old, Lamarcus Aldridge, Power, uh, Marcus Sol, leave some of them out, down. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take Paul Millsap out of that top top twenty. I think as good as Millsap is in in two years' time, Oldzipper will be clearly above him. I think. Yeah. Can I? But, but, can but I, Millsap will probably be head, be head this year. Can I have a shot? Another one of your uh, old guys yeah, in your. Uh, guy at 92, 91, wherever he is, Joe Johnson, he's 34 going on 51. And I, I've got two glaring omissions in your list. But first of all, explain to me, Joe Johnson, how can he make a, a dynasty and or a dynasty top 100 list? We talked about this before the podcast and I went to look at my list and I went, I don't know what Joe Johnson's still doing on this list. I didn't want to change it at the last minute. Um, I'll make an excuse for it. I, he, he is a, a, he's been a solid 80 to 90 guy for the last three years. He can probably do it for another two more seasons. It's probably not the most upside pick at pick 90, but it's, if it's, you're weighted towards winning in the next two years, picking Joe Johnson that late is fine. I'm not the proudest of that, of that ranking there. I am going to stick with it though. Um, but it's not, yeah, I'm not all that proud of it. I've, I've just got a tweet come through from uh, Tobias Harris and he says, Josh, do not call me Toby again. How dare you leave me out of your top 100 list? Where is Tobias Harris? Why not have Tobias Harris on there? Well, that's that's an oversight on my opinion, on my part. I, I thought, uh, yeah, Toby, I, I do apologize for that. Um, version 2.0, we'll, we'll definitely have him in there. He he uh, he should be a, a top 70 sort of guy, I think. I don't, oh. I don't know how I don't know how he fell out the list, but that's always uh, that's always likely to happen. Well, I have him. Uh, I can't find him off the top of my head. Another, I've got him you've at, got 50, you've got at 50, yeah, 52. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 23 years old. Yes, he's got ankle concerns, but another guy, he hasn't reached his prime yet. Give him two, three years. He'll be right around the mark. The other guy you haven't got on your list who, 21 years old, one of the better point guards in the league. I think he'll be a starting point guard in the next three to four years. That's Dennis Schroeder. Josh, not on your list. Yep. Um, I think he'll just be that far out of it this year. Like he was good in stretches last year. I think he probably the next two seasons, he's just not going to be a factor at all. I just don't think that he might play 20 minutes, but it's not top 100 worthy for the next two seasons. He's definitely someone I think I had, I took my list down to about 110. He was sitting at about 104, 105 around that rank. Because once he gets a job, yeah, he's going to be start becoming a, a top 50 sort of guy uh, pretty much straight away. But I don't think it happens for two years. And I think that the fact that he will be in a backup role, a limited minutes role for the next two years keeps him out of my top 100. If I was, if I was building to 2017, I'd be going hard after him. Because he's he him and a guy like uh, Cameron Payne would be guys that yeah you know, in 2017 it could be just fantasy studs. I just don't see much happening in the next two years. That's the problem I have with him. I think that once he gets to the end of his rookie contract, which is in two more years' time, that's when it will start to start to come together for him. Much like it did with uh, Eric Bledsoe once he was towards the end of his rookie contract, where he showed a couple of glimpses, but was never able to put it together as a as a 
a big fantasy guy because he never got the minutes. And I think that'll be the case for, for Schroeder as well. Yeah, and this is why we're looking at championship windows as well for your fantasy team. You've got, say, like Dwayne Wade um, ranked in your 80s there. I think my oldest guy is Tyson Chandler at 32, so I don't have Wade. I don't have Kobe. I don't have Duncan. Um, Kobe and Duncan are out for me. I don't even have Pau Gasol, I believe. Um, that's why, just too old. I think this season he will get injured. He had an awesome season last season, but I just can't see lightning striking twice. I've got Pau in there, I think. Uh, no, I don't. I, no, I, I'm with you. I took Pau out as well. Um, for that reason, I think he's probably got one to two. Kobe and Duncan, one season left each. Powers might have two at an elite level and probably going to be in injury interrupted as well. So I, I'm with you on Pau. Um, but again, if you're competing, you take Pau Gasol. Dwayne Wade, I think, has got probably three years left at a, at a pretty decent output. The injuries are always a concern for him. But Roto Leagues, you can, you can deal with injuries a little bit better. You just stick them on your bench. And you don't need to sub them in every day because you've got that games that games cap. So you can deal with Dwayne Wade in a roto situation a lot easier than you can in a head to head where you're trying to maximize your games played. So I'm not too worried about that. It's more about longevity. But I think that he can contribute for the next two to three cells, the three seasons at a pretty high level. And I've got him low. I've got him at eighty six. Um, you know, obviously he's probably not going to be the eighty six ranked player this year. I think that's probably a, I obviously think it's a pretty okay spot for him to be in, but I could understand if you had him completely out of it, depending on how you were looking at building your team. It's a big factor. Mario Hazonia for you in at 94. Where's he getting minutes? Above Tobias? Uh, above, uh, ahead of Oladipo? Uh, no, he's not. Once again, more of a long-term pick, three to four years down the track. In the Fantasy Hoops Insider podcast, we listed our top five guys. He was fifth or sixth off the top of my head in mine. Um, I think he can have a have a have a solid career, good career. One of these guys, steals and three sort of guy. Um, yeah, that's a that's an upside three four year down the track pick. Now, amazingly, at number one hundred, we both picked the same guy. Now we did these independently of each other, and I'm shocked that we came in the same. Okay, the same top five is fine to come in at number one hundred when there's probably another 50, 60 guys we could have put in the last twenty places. We both come out with the same guy at number 100, Aaron Gordon, who last year, I, there's no chance would have had him anywhere near um, after I saw him start to play at the start of the season, nowhere near the top 100. But he he looks different. He actually surprised me toward, as he got better during the season and then came back from that injury and started to look a bit better. And then he looked 100 times better in summer league. He's, what do you think of him this season? When does he become a guy? What's your thoughts on him? I'm not convinced for this season. Um, they've got Channing Fry there at that power forward position. That was a terrible contract. It's only a matter of time. Maybe maybe if they're not pushing playoffs, that they give Aaron Gordon the second half of the season after the All-Star break, and he does go and play 25 to 30 minutes at that power forward spot. It was, it was just a, a summer league hype pick. Why not? Someone's got to be at pick 100, and we both went Aaron Gordon. So... Yeah, once See, again, we, it's a it's a two, three, four year prospect pick, but who knows? Why not take a flyer uh, flyer on him at, at that stage of a draft? Agreed. Ben McLemore is a guy we've both got pretty high. You've got seventy four and eighty. I say pretty high. He's never been at that level, but I was really impressed with what he did last year. Uh, the Sacramento uh, Kings. Not much to say about them. Uh, He's going to play against ahead uh, of Marco Bellinelli. He's going to develop, and he's really developing into a, a pretty solid fantasy guy. And I'm happy that you've got him in that range as well. I think that's a, a really smart sort of area to have Ben McLemore because he can develop into a really solid guy, and he's got a not a bad roto game. Um, Jordan Clarkson, we've got him pretty similar as well. I think we both would agree that Jordan Clarkson this season is not approaching anywhere near the 63 or 68 where we have him ranked. Correct. No, not not unless uh, Kobe misses a, a huge chunk of, of the season. But once again, uh, D'Angelo Russell just muddies those waters there in, in in LA. So probably sort of guy who may need may need a change of scenery with with Russell um, on the roster. But we saw at the end of last season what he can do. Yes, it was only a short period of time, and maybe we should talk about someone else, um, Hassan Whiteside, Josh, but. Once again, in those mid rounds, um, a point guard with all the steals, really good percentages. Why not in a in a dynasty league? 
Yeah, it's that's right. I think that he he can approach a top fifty guy, two thousand sixteen, seventeen. Once Kobe's gone, no doubt. But this year we could be really disappointed, which me and Mark spoke about on yesterday's podcast. Disappointed with what we get from Clarkson and Russell with Lou Williams and Kobe there, um, destroying all semblances of, of uh, sharing basketball. Mention Hassan Whiteside. You're not concerned with the free throw rate with him? Sixty uh, two. Yes, I am. Yeah, I actually had him. I actually had him higher, and then moved him down once I was having a closer look at his free throw percent, forty eight percent after the All Star break. Um, I've got him at eighty five. Yeah, probably. What did I, what have I got him at? Uh, Sixty two. Sixty two. Yeah, I see. I don't mind if that comes down. Um, maybe ten spots, but once again, I've got him in Markeith Morris. Is he going to be better than Markeith? Like he could be. Is he going to be better than Porzingis? Who knows? I think he's going to be Kenneth. Well, I think he's going to have more value than someone like Kenneth Farid with his with his blocks, um, high field goal percentage. Um, actually, while we're around this ranking, Al Jefferson, I've got him really low. I think yeah, big difference we got know, him. He, he's thirty. He had a really really bad year last season. I think that's unfortunately the start of his decline. I don't think that's an outlier, and he can come back from that. He looks slow. He looks heavy. Uh, field goal percentage has dropped off. His blocks aren't there. His rebounds were down to eight. I just have serious concerns around Al Jefferson and I drafted him and owned him and I was heavily disappointed. I I am not I am a little bit he's not a top twenty guy anymore, which he was for a couple of seasons. I've got him at forty five. I still think that he can bounce back and be a top fifty guy for the next couple of couple of seasons, but yeah, he's probably not gonna last out the top the next four years as a top fifty guy, I wouldn't have thought. In in hindsight, would you have uh Valentunas over him? Not Dwayne Casey, really I, do, Valentunas has got that ability, and if there was a different coach who placed more faith in him, no doubt whatsoever. Uh, would I'd have him, but I'm worried he's getting held back. Would you have Nikola Mirotic over him? That, that's a similar thing. I just, uh, Yes, but it might take two years for that to happen. And again, I think that Jefferson will be better than him for the next two years because I just don't know what the Bulls are going to do with him. Um, if we, we come out and go, you know what, we're starting Mirotic and playing him 30 minutes, and Mirotic jumps up 30 spots on this ranking because he's going to be enormous for four years. But the chances are that he might not be enormous for another two seasons. But isn't it worth ha- having him on the roster and then getting four, five, six years of top 30, top 40 Nikola Mirotic? And th- why, why you've got the chance now, this may be the only chance you get to own Nikola Mirotic or Carl Anthony Towns. Go for it now. Depends. It, it also depends to me as well is that if you just talk to the guys in your league what are they doing? Are they building for the future? Because everyone wants to build for the future. You can go in and smash them for two years. You can go in there and just load up on guys who are going to drop off a cliff in two years and just destroy the league for two seasons. That, that you, you can do that if everyone's going young and everyone's going Carl Anthony Towns at pick 10 and D'Angelo Russell, they pick a pick 30 and Wiggins at 15. If everyone starts doing that, and you go in and go, I'm going, to, I'm going to take Duncan for a year. I'll take Dwayne Wade for three years. I'll take Mallow at 40. I'll take Al Jefferson at 60. You can just destroy the league for at least one or two years. And you know, if you've got prize money, collect that prize money and then go about rebuilding it as well. Um, it, it does depend on, on the way that you, you want to do it. Yeah. What, what? Go, on. go. I was just going to say, change, changing topic quickly. While we're on that sort of 50 to 60 range, we've both got Jabari Parker in there. Now, we only saw a glimpse of him last season. What's your sort of three to four long-term forecast around Jabari Parker and his fantasy value and what we're going to expect from him. He did a few things better than I anticipated. He shot the ball better and he got a lot more steals than I thought. He shot less threes than I anticipated. Um, but overall, I was relatively happy with what we saw from him. He was developing into a, a nice guy. The ACL is always a worry. It might cost him half a season in terms of getting back to his best, a full season here. He might not be back to his best. And that's why I've got him down outside the top 50 where you're just inside the top 50. Uh, if he didn't have the ACL, I'd probably have him another 15 to 20 spots higher. But I think it costs him a year, maybe a year and a half of, of development, of, of getting back uh, to full to full strength. Um, we saw Nerlens Noel took over half a season to really get going from his ACL and he took a full year off and Parker doesn't have the luxury of taking a full year off to come back from his ACL. Well, he took more than a full year off. No, he had like almost two years, no, 18 months off. And then he still took six months to get back from it. So that's why I've got him down that little bit lower. But I think that we both would agree that if he didn't have the injury, we'd have him a fair, a significant you know, chunk of spots higher. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah definitely. What do you think we're sort of looking at like a, 
a Rudy Gay type with maybe a little bit less scoring, but sort of what less less threes. No, I'm happy with your scoring, less threes. Um, but yeah, I think that's a that's a decent comparison. Rudy Gay is one of the most criminally underrated fantasy players there is. You, you, you don't a, want to be the guy that takes you don't want to be the guy that takes Rudy Gay in the second round, but based on his numbers, it wouldn't be dumb to do it. It probably would be because you could get him later on. But the numbers he put up down the stretch, he was a top twenty player down the stretch last year. Is that what you're going to you're going to hint at? I was just thought it was funny when you said you'd be stupid to take him in the second round, and your mate Steve took him at the the first pick of the third round. So he's just snuck by there. You know, you know, look. Sorry. You're not stupid to take him there. You, you, I'd say if, if you took him in the middle of the second round, you'd be stupid because you could you could probably get him and you pick the next round. Um, yeah. But obviously not if Steve's in your league because he'll snipe him at the start of round three. But if Steve hadn't grabbed him at, at that pick, I may have got may have jumped on him myself at the pick a, a couple of picks later. But I think he's a criminally underrated fantasy guy that puts up. Okay, his his stretch run last year was was magnificent. It was it was so good. His numbers were out of control. They were they were just big, and a lot of people don't really. Um, notice that or, or pay attention to that because the Kings were such a mess with what they were doing, but he was he was seriously good. Yeah, the best thing about Rudy Gay was 48% after the All-Star break and 84%. Those those numbers from a small forward position are just awesome. Yeah, yes, they are. They are very awesome. Um, anything else you want to pick on me about? Joe Johnson notwithstanding? Uh, no, I think Joe Johnson aside, mate, you've done a You've done a pretty good job, and we could stare at these rankings for all night and, and pick and go through them and change them. But let's uh, we'll put them out on the site, let the listeners loose on us, and and see what they think. And if they if they want to put uh, do a top hundred list, email them through to Josh. He can forward them on to me, and we'll yeah definitely them through them and pick, pick the the faults out of you your guys' lists as well. It, it is it is bloody hard to do because. Of exactly as we've tried to explain, you know, I'm looking at earlier success. Matt's looking a bit late. Like there's just so many ways to look at it. But please let us know who else I missed aside from T- Tobias Harris. Matt's probably missed someone else, and I haven't haven't managed to, to notice that. There's guys who are probably a little bit lower, and you can make arguments for this stuff. And that that's one of the reasons why Matt Dynasty leagues are, are, are fantastic because. Um, there's no like I'm going off the ESPN default rankings. There's none of that. It's it's very very like we talk about fantasy basketball and we talk about category leagues, right? As being yeah you know, a great sort of game, a better scenario than points leagues, in my opinion, in your opinion as well, because it's like playing eight points leagues in one. Yeah, you, know, you got to balance the strategy. Well, a dynasty leagues like taking that again and playing five seasons worth in one year to try and work out where the value is. And it's all over the place. Everybody else has got values all over the place. I can't wait for our Red Rock Dynasty League auction just to see the numbers that come out for guys. There's going to be some numbers where you're going to be like, yeah, whoa, Aaron Baines got signed for $20 million by the people. Oh, no, that was real life. Sorry. You're going to get some contracts where you're going, that is crazy, but nothing's crazy in a dynasty because so much can happen and everyone's got a different plan. And, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's enough. We're throwing another yep. element into the mix with with uh, salary and salary cap. So I don't know that it's going to be crazy. It's what is it? Is it sixteen or twenty teams? I forgot. Sixteen. Sixteen teams, four hundred players deep. Uh, salaries auction draft. Yeah. Good luck. Going to be uh, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. So as Matt said, our rankings are they're currently up on the website redrockbasketball.com. So go and check out our rankings. Leave a comment there. Tweet us, email us, uh, whatever you need to do to let us know what you think. Um, but just bear in mind that if you're going to have a go and you're going to tell us we're dickheads, try to do it yourself and, and just have a think about it and think about all the stuff that goes into it. Not as straightforward as it as it may appear. Matt, what have you got? You got any uh, articles coming out soon? Uh, not really. I've got a few in the works, but they're probably at least oh, probably at least six weeks away as we get closer into the season. So just doing or well, concentrating on our listener league draft and then a bit of draft prep for our auction dynasty league. So plenty happening um, in the next few weeks. You're in the middle of a mock as well, and then we're actually both doing a dynasty mock draft. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. We're doing that for the fantasy fix. Where I don't know who else is in it, but it's going to be a really interesting thing to see how that uh, how that auction not auction how that uh, how that mock draft goes for one. I've never done a, a mock a dynasty one before, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That's coming in the next two to three weeks. I think that we're going to be doing that. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's all we need to touch on. Um, again, check us out on uh, 
on Hardwood Paroxysm. Um, subscribe to their uh, iTunes feed as well. Get some there's some other great podcasts on there. Um, they got they got a heap, but they got I think about four or five different podcasts on their network. Uh, some NBA history stuff. Uh, some current day, some current days things. Uh, there's a, a great one they did in the lead up to the NBA draft with uh, uh, with Sam Vecini from CBS Sports covering. Uh, they basically just did one podcast on each team, mock draft, you know, th- one part for each team, which was uh, great. So I think it was a I think it's an amateur hour podcast, which is it talks all college stuff. So some great stuff on their podcast network, and I'm uh, I'm thrilled to be joining that network and and getting out to more people. Matt, where can everyone find you on Twitter to uh, to let them know what you think? Let them know. Now, let's try that again. To let you know what they think. Well, follow me on Twitter and I'll let them know what I think as well. That's fine. So follow me on Twitter <laughs> at SMN Sports. Uh, ask me any dynasty ranking questions, any fantasy basketball questions. I promise I answer them. If not, I'll give you your money back. Cool. That's a, a refund of $0. Fantastic. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Instagram is the same. I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. Um, don't forget to, to subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can participate like uh, like Mr. Downey Jr. did in today's uh, today's show. Uh, participate live as we're doing the, doing the podcast and doing the show. Um, Quick uh, look ahead to what's coming up. Seth Klein going to be here over the weekend. He's going to be looking at some of the guys he expects to take a big leap, and I'll be uh, debating that with him. And then, Matt, I've got a podcast coming next week, which I think is going to be probably the – I don't want to undersell what we just did because that was pure audio gold, but probably the best podcast of the offseason coming up. I've got Jeff Stotts from RotoWire coming on, the RotoWire injury expert. We're going to be breaking down all of the injuries that we need to be concerned about, uh, the prognosis of injuries – what was that? Pardon the pun. You're breaking down all the injuries. We are breaking down all of the injuries. Uh, hopefully not literally, but we will be talking about all the injuries, what to look for, whose prognosis is what, what's the recovery like, histories of injuries, to really give you an idea of, of where the risk lies. And I think that's going to be a really, really interesting interesting show, talking talking to Jeff and, and working out and just going through all these injuries and you know, what info he's heard on rehab, you know, past instances of this injury the likelihood of the training staff to take him slow or take him or get him back quick all that sort of stuff it's going to be really interesting and i'll tweet out some links to that uh later in the week um but you're more than w- welcome to send in any sort of questions uh, about that injury podcast now of guys you want to touch on but i'll try to cover most of the important guys when jeff comes on matt can, thank you for jumping i'll go, go can i ask the first question for jeff here you go I want to know about Kyrie Irving and his fractured kneecap. Will he be fine to start the season? Because I've drafted him. That is going to be a very, very big question. Uh, that's that's your question, Matt. My main question is, I've been debating this with people on Twitter, is Ricky Rubio injury prone? That's that's I, I say no. Somebody said yes. I want to hear what Jeff has to say. So you, you broke up at the critical moment then. What, what was your question? I dropped is, out. Is Ricky Rubio injury prone? Oh yes, I like it. So that's that's my question, um, uh, among lots of others. But that's something to look forward to. Uh, Matt, thank you, and say goodbye to uh, to everybody who is out there listening. Thanks, uh, Josh, and thanks everyone for watching and or listening. Catch you later. Everyone, get drafting in those Red Rock Listen leagues. Thank you for listening, everybody, and thank you for watching. See ya.